Hi, everybody. Welcome to Odd Film City. I'm Marina Yuriva. I'm the vice president of, um, of the festival. And today we're going to have a Q&A panel discussion with, um, with the short program uh, of committee recommended shorts. This is our new program, and I think it's very special. As a committee, as, as the festival, we get more than 600 films every year. And we choose um, about maybe over 100. So we, we get to watch a lot of films. And committee recommended films are the ones that are stand out, stood out for us. And so I, for me personally, I think those are the best ones and very, very special uh, films. And these three are, they're all very serious. They have raised very, um, they talk about very serious issues in LGBTQ community. Uh, I think two of them are kind of similar. Maybe all three, all three are similar in a way. And two of them talk also about very serious mental, about mental health in LGBTQ community. And one mostly talks about immigration and, and the LGBTQ rights in, in different countries. So I'll just let uh, everybody to present their films. Um, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Hi. Uh, my film's Too Rough, which was filmed in Glasgow in 2020. Um, you'll have Maybe seen you can, you, can, you can remind the plot. Yeah, so it's about um, Nick and Charlie who are stuck in a, they're trapped in a bedroom, a small bedroom for most of the film. And Nick has to conceal his boyfriend from his uh, dysfunctional family who are on the other side of the door. And as the film goes on, they become more and more sort of um, delirious and hungover and hungry. And it's kind of what happens when that uh, limitation is put on a relationship and how that affects people's shame and people's love. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sam, you're directed Baba. I, yeah, I'm Sam. Um, I co-wrote and co-directed Baba with Adam uh, mm -hmm. Ali. I'll be here. He's filming at the moment, so his head is full in, in that world, um, unfortunately. <laughs> um, he's the more glamorous and more intelligent other half of the filmmaking <laughs> team. Um, but Baba is <clears throat> set in Libya in Tripoli, the capital, um, in tunnels beneath the city where a, uh, a queer found family of people um, exist. Um, and the story is about uh, a 17 year old queer boy called Britannia um, and his dream of going to Britain because in his mind to be truly gay, you have to be British. Um, and uh, in the film, we, we follow him over the course of one night as he tries to get his passport um, and goes on a journey of discovering more about whether that dream is um, is right for him, I suppose, yeah. So did you film it in Libya or did you film it in, in Britain? We, it, it was a lockdown nightmare. We had two sets of flights booked to go abroad to film in different places. The first was the funders decided it would be too dangerous for us to go and film there. Mm -hmm. um, so we were forced to cancel that. And then the second set of flights um, has to be cancelled for lockdown came into force so we ended up filming it in manchester <laughs> which uh, which is a real shame because the film is really a love letter to libya um but we had to try and make it work so hopefully it, it doesn't show so much in the film but but yeah we rewrote the script in a few days and, and shot it in manchester okay thank you quinn and talk about your film how's it going um quinn i'm the writer director of intertemptation um, it's about a young man, Juan, uh, who confronts a, the priest who abused him 20 years later and is told in one evening in real time. And it explores not only the themes of abuse, but how 
abuse affects people differently. So it's not just the standard. You hurt me, I want revenge. Um, I think the thing that we did, that Tom and Juan did well is making him so human. And that was the most important thing about the film. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it also wasn't, it didn't really look like a revenge. Yes, it that's, yeah, that's what I was actually in love with him. Yes. So that's one of the things I wanted to explore because a lot of the thing, a lot of the cases and stories that come out of the priest abuse scandal, um, it just shows that one side, one effect, but there's, but abuse and trauma affects people differently. Yeah? And so we wanted to explore how these are, these are priests, they are men of God. And so if they tell someone that this is God's will and stuff, like they've got no reason to not believe it. And the same with love. If someone tells you I'm doing this because I love you and things, you've got no reason to not believe them. So we want to explore that shade of gray uh, of how that can really affect you mentally. Yeah, that's very interesting. And Tom, you're, you're playing the priest. Yes, um, I play Father Graham in Quinn's film, Into Temptation. I, I liked it because it's, you know, it talks about two psychologically disturbed men. They're disturbed for completely different reasons. Right. And what Quinn has presented here is a very unique take on the pedophile priest abusing a young boy. And he shows how complicated and bumpy and messy the path is across a period of 20 years. It's not a cut and dried situation. It's, it's very complex. And he's explored that uh, in a very deep, very sensitive manner. Yeah. And Juan? So yes. you're playing that the main character. Uh, yes, I, I, I played Michael in uh, Into Temptation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how was it for you? Um, it was intense. It was intense and fast. Everything happened really fast. I tried to, um, I knew the, the way of the story, obviously, but, um, for the sake of, of filming and, and my acting and what I was focused on, I kept everything pretty narrow and, uh, just try to limit, um, the, the scope of what the the entire story was and I was just very focused on um, uh, understanding the the uh, the the sort of uh, the blinders of of Michael's um, understanding of this type of love so that was it was tricky in two ways it was intense as like a story and then also intense as just the uh, performance right. And the music was very yes. It, it underlined the the emotions so good and the the drama of it. So Paul, you're a compo the composer of that. That's right. Thank you, and thank you, Juan, for the vote of confidence. <laughs> um, it was um, definitely. A, I've worked with Quinn before, and we have. I think what's really interesting is I love you know, stories of other composer directors, obviously the big one being um, John Williams and Steven Spielberg. But um, when I met Quinn and we first worked together, it was really clear to me how powerful that kind of relationship can be, that kind of friendship. And we we just really have a direct line to each other's ways of thinking about the world, I think, and, and our creative process. So um, it was really simple in a way to, um, jump on board um but yeah the the music i mean from my point of view i'm seeing this heartbreaking story of a a boy who like quinn said just why wouldn't he believe that father graham loved him and that this was love and how tragic that can be to you know the, the loss of innocence um that occurs in that kind of a situation so for me i um i you know i focused on the uh, two instruments really the flute um, which represents his innocence childlike innocence and uh, the cello which is kind of like their twisted love theme if you will or the loss mm -hmm. of that innocence mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. to me it was really important to and i think also to quinn to highlight the tragedy and the emotion not the 
you could just go into to a typical route and be like, oh, this is sick. And um, yeah, Father Graham's a monster. And yet it's so much more complex than that and so much more uh, emotionally wrought than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so maybe each of you can talk about how this, all these three films are very emotional, very hard to watch and very thought provoking. And maybe you, you can talk about the, your idea of the film and how did it match your expectation and um, did you, maybe what did you want to say and did, did it work out as you expected and what did you like the, the most out of it? Um, okay, <laughs> Sam. Uh, Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's really hard to say, really, because I don't think, <clears throat> I think it's a film that's, um, people's reactions are totally different, depending on um, where they're from. We've, we've had mm. some screenings with people, uh, you know, with Muslim communities um, that, that have been really emotional for people, because I think they, there's one there's kind of two people in particular. There's one girl in particular who's 14 who watched it with a, a school screening that we did. Uh, and after the class, she was packing up her bag and everything and everyone's kind of like filtering out the classroom. Um, and she just had, she's taken a little bit too long to zip up her bag, you know what I mean? And she's waiting for everyone to go. And everyone filters out, then it's just her left in the room at the end. As soon as everyone left, the door shuts and poof, she just kind of came to flood of tears. She realized for the first time that this, that that was her, that there was a kind of connection there. So for her, the kind of quality of the film almost didn't matter. The story didn't matter. It was just seeing a sort of um, uh, uh, real people with, with heart and humanity, P people who can laugh, who had a kind of similar experience to her and, and to see people praying because she prayed quite a lot. You know, she, she was just Muslim, like um, she'd never seen it before. So there's kind of there's that extreme of emotion which is which is really beautiful to see the more general thing which i kind of find interesting is it kind of ends with this cliffhanger right of his hand on the door handle of not knowing right. is he gonna having having been on this journey of sort of learning to love libya um and and see that there is love in his family his problem is his sexuality it's not him um and understanding a bit more about the complexity of homophobia in kind of this north african country where religion and relate your relationship to your country and your religion is is bigger than your relationship to your family members um people come out and say they really some people say they really want him to get out of that car and go to the embassy and, and escape and then mm -hmm. other people say oh, he's got his friends he's got his you know we've screened it sometimes and heard people kind of arguing afterwards about <laughs> what they think he should do and i think that's what good story is when it's that for me at least anyway there's there's no good <laughs> there are two good options or there are two bad options depends if you're a pessimist or an optimist i suppose but um, right. yeah. um this guy is kind of stuck and i think that's what like life is a series of decisions where we're just stuck between mm -hmm. two bad outcomes probably <laughs> i don't know um mm -hmm. we just try and choose the best one we can um, yeah, yeah and i have kind of specific question it it was a bit confusing to understand what was happening when he went to get his passport yeah. Uh, yeah. So he expected his father to hate him or to to he he, he expected a different reaction, right? Yeah, but exactly. as I saw in in the film, or maybe I saw it wrong that it was his mother or what what was they afraid of the people yeah. outside or the mother that she will come back. That's exactly it. It's just the people outside, so he can be seen, you know, his his dad can hug him and can love him. The person who kicked him out of his house or mm. caused him to be too scared to stay when he was eight can mm. love him and can hug him and hold him and want him to be there. But um, the, the kind of Ray homophobia set up, which is so smart in a way, it's like intricately designed. Um, so hats off to whoever designed homophobia. But you can't be seen to show your love mm. for your child because that, you know, that's the kind of issue there. So I guess that's like the nub of um, 
the nub of it. I guess in the film, you know, we, we did it in one take, so it feels quite kind of fast and frenetic. And I kind of wanted audiences to be questioning that moment mm-hmm. of not really knowing, because Britannia, our main character, doesn't really get it. He is, he is confused at the end. So I kind of wanted mm-hmm. to feel this like whirlwind of not quite getting it. But that's exactly right. Yeah, it's that homophobia is the way it's set up. Um, right. Yeah. Of, but, yeah, no, go ahead, Marina. Oh, no, I just wanted to say that the, the other thing about you, you already mentioned in the taxi, the last scene, that was, I think, for each immigrant who who's kind of running away or leaving the homophobic country, it's always that feeling, you know, I'm from Russia, so it's... Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's... And and there there is always that feeling that you are leaving your home, and there are many things that you love about it, and you're you're leaving your friends, your family, and everything that you're used to. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time, you have to go. You you cannot you cannot stay if you want normal life. If you want to be equal, you cannot you cannot stay. Yeah, exactly. It's um, I, I guess it's kind of wanting to put um, audiences in that position of those uh, impossible decisions because people do have friends out there. You know, Adam always tells stories of his time in Libya and when he went back uh, more recently. Of like, you know, there's missiles flying overhead and they're lip syncing to "Firework" by Katy Perry out in some yard. You know what I mean? It's this kind of like that there is living in a war zone and living in a really oppressive state, there is joy to be found and there's friendships to be forged, maybe even more so, because mm-hmm. uh, to find your community is extremely special. Um, but I guess the film as well, we want it to be about also, you know, how much do people fit in? In We, we talk about Manchester and Canal Street, which is the kind of like uh, queer village in Manchester quite a lot. Mm-hmm. It's all about fitting in in the film. And mm-hmm. I guess it came from Adam and I having this conversation because we'd go out quite a lot in Manchester together and Adam would walk down the street wearing this like mesh dress with like this 12 foot train and everyone's like, oh, my God. you know, <laughs> Adam just like fits in on Canal Street, right? And I was saying this to Adam and, and saying like, God, it must be so fun to feel like you really fit. And Adam was like, I don't feel like I fit in at all on Canal Street because I'm like, I'm not white, I've not got a six pack or I've not got blue eyes or blonde hair, you know, and he just couldn't have yeah. those things. Which, of course, like I don't have any abs, but, you know, like, I, objectively, I could, and I'm white, and I've got blue eyes and blonde hair, right? So I feel like I should be fitting in on Canal Street. And I kind of reveal, of course, like, I don't feel like I fit in at all in this place. Mm-hmm. So then we sort of came, came up with this idea of um, making a film about fitting in in queer, in queer kind of spaces. And, like, you know, if I don't fit in on Canal Street, then what the hell does this 17-year-old kid living underground in Tripoli uh, you know what hope does he have of fitting in in this place so i guess like it's as much a film about britain and or generally about queer spaces the queer spaces we build for ourselves as it is about the reality for people living in libya and north africa and the middle east more non-specifically yeah thank you and sean so to rock is you can talk about the idea and how it, it got inter- incorporated in your film. And it's also kind of, uh, th- there are similarities with Sam's film as getting out that they, they have to, to the danger, that, that danger, but not because of the country, but because of the family they're in. Well, but yeah, the exactly. Films, the films yeah. are similar and that they have to get out yeah of course i mean it's not a country at war but i definitely try to create a kind of war zone in a domestic space um because i think that's what an abusive household can feel like everyone's kind of at war with each other and especially in working class glasgow like there's there's um a feeling of combat and intense defensiveness um in the in the air and the walls um so yeah, I mean, I've had, it, it's interesting when you realise it's hard to watch for other people because actually you've seen it obviously a million times in the edit and, you know, it's it's based a lot on my uh, background. So I'm kind of used to 
a lot of the things presented in it, but I screened it in Germany a few weeks ago. And this this girl came up to me afterwards and she was like, I wasn't sure how I felt about your film. And I was like, okay. She was like, uh, yeah, I'm just I'm not really used to seeing, I'm not really used to being confronted with abuse like that. So yeah, I don't know how I feel. <laughs> I was like, sorry, but I was like, obviously you've never been abused then, you know? And then the opposite reaction came from, you know, I, I screened it in Glasgow and uh, there was a BSL interpreter there who was translating the Q&A and um, she hadn't said a word obviously because she was speaking in BSL and then she came up to me afterwards and mm. um, there's, a, there's a shot in my film where um, at the height of uh, at the height of the chaos when the, the family are fighting well, outside in the court, other ears, right? yeah that's the shot yeah, yeah. so um, that shot seems to really hit people it's that the main character covers his little brother's ears so his little brother can't hear the sound and then his boyfriend covers his ears so there's a sort of three shot of um these boys and they're they're covering each other's ears and she the, the, this bsl interpreter came up to me and she said i wish i wish i'd had someone to cover my ears mm -hmm. uh, when i was um, in that situation and she started crying and I started crying and it was like it was like this was the the exact two reactions that I hope for when I'm when I make anything to to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed I guess you know like um and yeah that's been that's why I love festivals and and actually I'm so glad we can go and see your films again in person because then you you get that visceral human response mm -hmm. and also so the boyfriend character it's he gets evolved during the film from you know they're just hanging out at somebody's party right and he he wants to see his boyfriend's place because they're always hanging out at his place kind of like very innocent and he he doesn't think too much about it but then when he wakes up and then his basic needs to to drink to 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 have a glass of water to go to the bathroom that's when he realizes how bad it is in in that house right that's when it hits him and that's and then at the end he he goes like i i'm i'm staying here with you i'm not leaving you right that it it shows so much yeah in such a short time well yeah he's such a critical character for that reason because he's like the the yardstick of um the the person from another world the middle class um guy who is starting to understand um a, a completely different reality um but of course he's going into like a racist house as well and he's not white so right this is like a something that it touches on as well is is, is how much mm -hmm. how much is he willing to endure you know but I think him um, class is left out of the conversation a lot uh, when it comes to inclusion I think we talk a lot about uh, race gender but these things intersect so much with class because if you're a um, if you're black and working class and a woman like these things intersect um so much and your life becomes so much you have so many more obstacles than if you come from a, a more privileged economic background so um but you know i don't really think about these things when i'm writing because you're just trying to tell like the best story but uh, i'm starting to see now how um how it is confronting people from different classes that uh, aren't sure how they feel about it you know but that's why i think it's like I'm so happy that I made it because I think these environments need to be illuminated, you know. Right. And also you're showing so much about mental health and how that environment, how it affects the mental health and what, what happens. Absolutely. I think, I mean, I mean, to me, most suffering in the world comes from like a lack of connection and connection is 
impossible when you're in a state of like self-defense and I think most people at most times are in a state of even if it's unconscious they, they have their guard up and Nick the lead character in this film is he's such a soft sensitive soul that's just been hardened by this environment and it's mm-hmm. only when he actually like has the courage to to connect and to drop the guard that he actually finds peace you know um, and so, yeah, I think to me, mental health is so much about um, being in a state of constant self-defense, which just leaves no room for for real connection or or passion or love. And I think that's something that a lot a lot of um, queer people um, exist within. That's a space where all because because we, we we've grown up having to constantly have a guard up or have a present a, an authentic. Mm-hmm version of herself so actually when you grow up you have to learn and constantly disarm yourself you know I have to disarm myself every day because I can go to like from zero to a hundred um I can go into a combat state like so readily and I don't want to live like that you know so I'm mm-hmm. having to disarm and I, I think that's a big part of like the film right the breaking the cycle and everything Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> Queen, so talking about mental health, your film takes it to the different, to the next level, right? And can you talk about that idea? And... Well, with the thing we want to do with the film, and one of the reasons it took so long to get made, is because I didn't want to tell a black and white story. Um, People know the scandal. We've seen it. We've heard it. We've, there's lots of movies. There's lots of books. There's lots of news coverage about it. We know the priests who abuse kids. We know they're bad guys. And so I want to explore another angle to show more of the understanding. And that's where I think a lot, where the divisiveness in the film comes in, is that we're not showing who the bad guy is and we're not telling the audience how to feel. We're, showing, we're just showing two damaged individuals. Um, and showing the consequences of that damage. Um, and that was the important thing with Father Graham is we have to show the priest as a human figure with substance and stuff, because if we don't, as we disrespect the survivors. It's like a, a woman who gets abused by her husband. If we only show this man as abusive and mean and things, there's no understanding for this woman. But if we show the man and how he manipulates her and apologizes, you know, and sucks up to her, then we start understanding why people keep that cycle going. And like that was the most important thing with the film is to show the Father Graham as a human, very damaged figure who does harm. And then on the flip side, showing Juan, Michael as the survivor of that, but who still believes every word this holy man told him because when a priest tells you they've got no reason to not believe them, but on the same side, it's a love story. And when someone says they love you, you've got no reason to not believe that they don't love you. Right. And you, you used, so you used different actors for the young, young Michael and adult Michael, right? And, yes. and the older priest and the, the younger priest. No, 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 that's yeah, yeah. No, that's me. I'm playing up. Very, it's the same, yeah, same person across twenty years. I I I take that as a compliment for the uh, the hair and makeup person. Yes, uh, that was very good because I thought it. You, you, there are two different actors. (laughs) Oh, that's so interesting. I've had someone else tell me that, and it it Mm -hmm. amazes me. We we shot it so that the the younger version of me was done on the second day, so Mm -hmm. I shaved and. uh, and took that off for the younger me. And I, I had grown the facial scrub that you see here. I'd grown that out for the uh, the first day of filming. Oh, but, uh, nice. No, I'm pleased to hear that you thought it was a different actor. That's mm-hmm. actually a good thing. <laughs> and also, so the different actor, the, the different characters, they, they intermingle in the, in the film. The, the younger priest, 
with with the boy we, we see a younger priest with the boy and younger priest with the uh, with, with the adult michael and older priest with the adult michael but never the boy with the older priest right because it's it is technically across a period of approximately 20 years mm -hmm. so that's i think one of the strengths of it is you know you see this this relationship evolve um you know i think to quinn's credit i mean he's completely avoided the stereotypes um, we've seen the pedophile priest abusing the boy many many times in other film and television projects but he's avoided all of those stereotypes and i remember when i had the audition for the project um I thought, well, I'm going to do this my way, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to play the bad guy. I'm not going to do that. That's 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 not me. So, I thought, well, I'll just play him as kind of that nice everyman, the the nice guy next door that we all have. I mean, he seems like a nice guy, but we don't really know what goes on behind closed doors, now, do we? Mm -hmm. So that was my take on him, and and then when we started filming, Quinn said to me at the very beginning that he wanted the priest to be a charming charismatic man. He wanted it to be believable that a young boy would fall in love with an mm -hmm. older man. Right. So this guy has to be charming and persuasive and kind and gentle. I mean, it, it presents, you know, abuse and abuse is not always in this kind of scary, hostile, angry, yelling environment. I mean, abuse can yeah. occur in so many different types of settings. And what, what films often do with this subject matter is, you know, they, they make they make my character the bad guy. I mean, Paul would come in and cue this scary music when I get my close up kind of thing. And, you know, Quinn avoided all of that. So, you know, it shows how, how real life it can be. And all four of us were at the premiere screening of the project and someone came up to me at the very end of the screening and they said that they actually felt more sympathy for my character rather than Juan's character. And I've had a couple other people say that to me. And I thought that's, so interesting because I mean I you know I'm the deviant one I, I abused a boy isn't it cut and dried but there's so much ambiguity in the film that people get to interpret it it mm -hmm. is subject to your own individual interpretation so you know we've had a lot of reactions that are different like Quinn you should talk about um, the screening you went to uh, somewhere else and then and, and a woman came up to you I mean you're getting wildly different reactions to this film and that's exactly what films should do. They should bring a response and it should be very unique and individual. And I think Quinn's, you know, been the recipient of, of, of a lot of that. And your your character at some point, he says that phrase, they throw me into the garden, right? So I love, I love that, that line. That's how he interprets, justifies it for himself, right? Yes, in an earlier draft of the script, um, a little bit of that got cut in the in the final version. But I loved that line because it really informed me as to who this character was. And in an earlier draft, if I'm going to paraphrase this properly, I, I basically say he put me in the garden and surrounded me with these these apples, these beautiful apples. And now I'm being punished mm -hmm. for taking a bite. It was just a little bite, and that told me so much about this character and the delusion that goes on in his head mm -hmm. and how he rationalizes that this isn't so bad. I mean, I have this job where I'm surrounded by boys and I have my needs because I'm an adult man. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is just what happens. So mm -hmm. he's so delusional and he knows how to draw these boys in. And in this case, in this film, you know, Quinn's presented the Michael character as, you know, someone, it makes you wonder, you know, was he psychologically disturbed at birth, DNA, or was he psychologically disturbed by the incident with me as a priest? Right. You know, how did, how did Michael evolve and become such a damaged person? I mean, I'm clearly a damaged person, mm -hmm. but Michael goes down this completely strange path. And then we come together 20 years later and you see the level of psychosis for him has become extreme. And that's why it's a fascinating confrontation um, between the two characters. Yeah, that's very true. And Juan, maybe you can talk about your character and how psychologically 
mm, different he is and what what goes on in in his head in your interpretation oh you're muted <laughs> and and yeah and you yeah i feel very protective over michael just even hearing about all just hearing tom i'm like you know what i'm, I'm gonna tell you um no i i just really focus on this idea that this man did what he did and he got out clean and because of my perception of him and my promises made to me by him and my loyalty i i um i ultimately <laughs> suffered in silence the idea of 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 the silence um overcoming you and and i, I just not um being able to grow and 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 develop um mentally in an, in a normal healthy way as a as a as a uh, an adolescent as a teenager and then ultimately as an adult man um living with this like incredible obscured secret that uh, yeah, i think that's what queen was showing with the different characters the boy and and the adult michael and interacting yeah. them right and you don't you cannot tell at which point there is adult and there is a boy because they're kind of this, still the same, right? Yes. Yeah. It's that. Um, it's the moment. I don't know. I, I always I see it as like this. Um, he's just kind of there with him all the time. The moment of impact or whatever, whatever the the precise moment that uh you know hinged his life in a certain direction that it wasn't supposed to go in emotionally mentally um the the stuntedness of that and the the feeling that you have to sort of do do right by that kid by that who i was at 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 eight you know and and um and clearing things up for myself and 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 I think that the intensity of the film comes from that element of this is the this is it like this is the eleventh hour. The answers need to be answered today, um, or something really bad is going to happen. <laughs> and um, you know that's that's ultimately, I guess, what happens is is I can't. I'm never going to be cleared of this and clear and and it's obvious to me that his his um his gaslighting his like uh, his like ability to to kind of clear himself of all of it and justify it all is not enough for me mm -hmm. as michael to to be okay with moving on and letting him move on and i think it's um I th yeah it's interesting and the writing that's what makes the writing good it's you know Topically, I'm I'm the aggressor in the film, and I'm the one, you know, uh, physically imposing to this this older man. And I found it so know, emotional. The did end he the do film. what he did? I don't. We don't know. You know, the, the the ending has this this frightening quality, but it also has this kind of tenderness. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it seems like this is the answer for both characters, and. As as it as it builds, when when I saw it on a, on a second showing, it it there's this there's this moment that 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 triggers this, and, and I see the inevitability of what's going to happen, and it's it's it it fills you with such conflicted feelings mm -hmm. about is is this the right answer for these people for both of them? Is it right for the one to make the decision that affects the other? When of course the other was the one who instigated this as a catalyst all along, and I don't know, it's just wonderfully, wonderfully complex. And you know, I think Quinn has presented something here that's that's such a unique spin on a story that has been told before, 
And it's, it's something you really have to see so that you can form your own opinion about it because, you know, people have a very strong response to abuse and especially if people have been abused and I certainly understand that, but it's, um, there's such a tremendous backstory behind abuse mm -hmm. and, and it impacts people their entire life. So you can't just summarize it in a sentence. You can't just say it's one or two words and that's that and package it away and throw it away. It's something that changes things permanently. Mm -hmm. And you have to find a way to live with that or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or not. <laughs> don't want to offer any spoilers, but you got to live with it or not. And so yeah. what is the answer for you? What is and the answer for the abuser and the, and the answer for the person being abused? And of course, everyone around them has an opinion, but it's very unique to that situation and those two individuals. So right. it's a tough yeah. scenario. Mm -hmm. And I have a question about religion. Um, so it's about Catholicism and, yeah. and suicide. So how do you explain because for, for me, I can I, I understand that Michael is is mentally um, there are ment mental issues, but how does he explain for himself that the completing suicide that's against his religion and it's obvious that his religion is important, right? Yeah, so how, well, so Michael. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, how do you explain that? Well, for Michael is just bringing um, Father Graham's words to life. I mean, Father Graham used the Bible and God's words to manipulate him as a kid. Like God wants mm -hmm. us to be together, all that stuff. So that when Michael commits the things he does, he's just doing what God wanted them to be doing in the first place just not as Father Graham had hoped for, he, because he never saw the, the end result. He did it to manipulate this boy and thought that was the end of it at like eight years old. But those words like grew in Michael and my, as like with any religious fanaticism or fringe movement, like you listen to the words, but it's what you, how you interpret those words about how far you take them for Michael, Michael believes that God wants them to be together and they're meant to be together. And that's what he does to bring them together. I, see. I don't know if that answers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It and shows how complex it is. Right. Yeah. And Juan, maybe for, for you, how do you explain that for your character? The, the following of religion? Yes. What's um, important for him? Is it religion or is it love or is it is it the same? I I don't I I wonder I wonder if I can answer this without I I'd, I'd love for people to just have whatever their perspective is when they watch the film. I can only talk about I guess like what my point of view was as as a as an actor for Michael. I just the the religion for me in in regards to michael felt like a huge betrayal and mm. i felt like i used religion as this sort of um how do i explain this like i want to rub it in your face that this is the this is what you use to to make me who i am today you know and i think i I felt he was um, clean of religion. I think ultimately it, it, you get to this point of like, uh, it, you know, ex extreme thinking, you know, really, um, he, he had to grow up and, and try and make sense of, of everything that happened in his life in this very particular time. And I think, 
for me, the 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 deep dive into religion and and making sure that I understood how how that was used against me, or how that was used to 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 trick me to to get me to 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 be a certain kind of person for someone is a huge betrayal, but ultimately um, it, it comes all crashing back because that's, uh, you know, my love is for this man that abides by these, by these rules. And like, I know them inside and out. It's such a, it's, it's such a part of my life, you know? And yeah, that there's conflict in that, that I felt like I wanted to, to be be alive in in my performance, you know, I don't I don't know that it's so. Uh, yes, he still believes, or no, he does not. It's, I don't know. It's bringing both of those elements. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. So, Paul, to to summarize this film, what was what were the most crucial moments for you, and how did you? You use music to to underline them. It's uh, a good question. I um, the I think the crucial the first crucial moment that I really latched onto was when Michael showed the scars to his scars to mm -hmm. Father Graham, and that actually kind of immediately inspired for me the whole sequence that happens after that to, to the very end of the film. And that was actually the first piece, that was the first cue I wrote was that whole ending because um, it encapsulated for me just how deep that went for Michael. His life was basically dedicated to this man almost in a weird, sick way. That's how I almost interpreted that. Like, if I can't, live with you loving me then i should i don't want to live that that was how deep it went and it was just so incredibly moving to me um that it really inspired them that love theme if you will it's kind of twisted mm -hmm. love theme. the loss of innocence theme of of him being taken by this false idea of love so far that his life didn't he didn't want to live without it. Yeah. He was trapped entirely by it. So yeah, that was the kind of pivotal moment for me when I first watched the cut. Um, yeah, I also drew a lot though from those moments like you were saying about when all of a sudden little boy Michael mm -hmm. was in the same room as present day Michael. Yeah. And that, that like, um, kind of mashup of realities mm -hmm. and the um the 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 thing that i drew there was just that like he you could call it either like arrested development kind of thing like that he's stuck in that time but also not just that his he still believed in innocence and in love it just was mm -hmm. usurped or taken by and ma manipulated by this older man. Yeah, so he, or so, it so, can be his inner child. Yeah. He, he still had a lot. It wasn't like he was dead inside and just, you yeah. know, like psychotic. He was, he really believed in that, like, inner child, the inner child's innocence, in his inner child's innocence. He believed in, in true love and salvation. And, you know, it, it, it's like he, was developmentally stuck but he took that as like where is this love where is this love i need to find this love i need to you know you told me this was love where is it like show me it again like yeah. i i believe in it so that combination that that innocence that was still there that just really truly wanted to find that truth like mm -hmm. tell me this was love but it was blocked by the manipulation and the 
you know, it was kind of like Father Graham used it for his own devices. He used his his innocence mm -hmm. against him. He used his innocence to keep him coming back. And he, he he very clearly understands that there is no love. He 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 said that at some point. Mm -hmm. And Father Graham did, yeah. Right. And, and Michael couldn't believe it. Like he can't understand that. And I think the saddest part of that is to realize that who out of those two is more sick hmm. is that that priest compared to 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 the kid to the to michael is maybe not as sick and he realizes what he's doing and and michael is completely not not in this world yes and like i think that's Definitely one of the things I wanted to play with was that shifting of loyalties and sides. Like the film starts one way, you think it's going, and then we get more information mm -hmm. and then, you know, swapping loyalty constantly. Yeah? And like, that's the thing with the views, like Father Graham did a terrible thing, but the, what happened to Father Graham that made him do these things? You know, that's how the cycle mm -hmm. continues. And also uh, like researching for the film, it's a lot of these priests are known to have these habits and these predilections and stuff, but the church still protects them. The church still puts them amongst children. And that is why that line is they put me in the garden and surround me by apples. That's why they were so important is because the church possibly knew of Father Graham's predilections and still did that. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to explore like that's Father Graham's abuse but michael is also an abuser in this situation it's like who's at fault but also who saw who was the first one to be abused that started the cycle is i think an important thing to also address right and the, the other thing that i was i had a discussion about this film um and th there another interpretation can be that you know we, we see the little boy um as young michael but you can also see the little boy as just another child and we don't really know if if, if michael is continuing that cycle or not yes right yes so one of the reasons that, that was an intentional decision because I never wanted to show flashbacks as flashbacks in the film, mm -hmm. which is why we see the young and the older version and the young and of, the, yeah. of Michael too. Um, it was for, the main reason was to show that this isn't the past for Michael. This is still happening in his mind right now. It, it's still fresh, but mm -hmm. on the other side of that is to always keep the audience guessing and to allude to those things that like michael becoming the abuser to something else, then realizing oh it's not another kid and then when he finally breaks when he finally speaks at the end and breaks his silence that's mm -hmm. like that michael has inadvertently ended the cycle by doing what he does right yeah. these two people will never hurt other people again mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you so much this was a wonderful discussion and i think we can talk more about it <laughs> but um we're out of time and um thank you i wish you all all the best in all your future projects and we hope to hear more from you and and to get more new films uh and see you again yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye.